It's always a blessing to be back in the house of Yahweh. Uh, and it's, it's all of you that make it the house of Yahweh, see. So the, the assembly, church, or the congregation isn't just the building, it's the people. Uh, we make up the, the assembly or the church. And uh, it is great to see so many people here today. We had a packed house yesterday, and uh, I was glad for that, and we have a packed house today. So uh, it's great to be back. It's great to be back. Um, before we get into our Father's Word, I'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll have a little Bible study. Almighty Yahweh, thank you, Father, for creating the heavens and the earth. Sometimes, Yahweh, I go outside and I look at the moon and the stars and I marvel, Yahweh, during the day at the sunshine and the warmth that it gives us. I see the birds flying around the yard and little squirrels gathering the acorns. Yahweh, Father, you created all things for your pleasure. You are a great creator and designer. And we lift you up today. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our mighty one, Yahweh alone. Thank you, Yahweh, for creating humans as well. And thank you, Yahweh, for giving us the opportunity to have a relationship with you. We do lift up all of those in the world that are far from you. And we pray, Yahweh, that they would be able to see the love and the grace and the mercy that you have even towards unbelievers who you let live and breathe and enjoy life every day. And Father, I pray that you would bless this lesson today, not because it's me, but because it's your word. I pray we would be better equipped, educated, encouraged, edified, rebuked where needed. And I pray, Yahweh, that we would not just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. Yahweh, we thank you for Brother Jerry's lesson yesterday on Sabbath. But it's one thing to hear that. It is another thing to do it. Help us, Yahweh, do it. Help us, Yahweh, take the medicine of your word. I pray all these things to you, Almighty Yahweh, through your only begotten Son, Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Amen. Just about everybody knows who Moses is. There has been movies made about the Exodus from the old Ten Commandments movie, one of my all-time favorites with Charlton Heston, even though they didn't get everything right. I still enjoy watching that movie. And all the way to the animated, much more modern movie, Prince of Egypt. Moses is a household name overall, and rightfully so, because Moses is one of the greatest men in all of Scripture. Even the very Messiah that we follow is called a prophet like Moses. But Moses got started in life because of strong women. I'm speaking of how Moses made it through persecution, the threat of death, and his upbringing. Moses was born into a hostile government, and as a Hebrew boy, born in Egypt at a time when the Egyptians enslaved the Hebrews, Moses should not have made it out alive. But Yahweh had special plans for Moses, and Yahweh used women to make sure that Moses got to where he needed to be. During the time of Joseph, at the end of the book that we call Genesis, the Hebrews and the Egyptians were friends. Joseph's wife actually was an Egyptian named Asenath. She was the mother of Ephraim and Manasseh, Genesis 41. In Genesis 50, Pharaoh respected the death of Jacob Israel, Joseph's father, and gave him a proper burial. And even the Egyptians mourned for Jacob for many days at his death. But things did not stay the same after Joseph and his brothers died out. Their generation passed on, and a new king arose who didn't really know all that Joseph had done in Egypt and for the Egyptian people. 
this king, this new king, became worried that the Israelites would outnumber and overpower the Egyptians. And the Egyptian government began to oppress the Israelites. They worked them as forced labor. They beat them with whips. They made their life bitter. However, the Bible says that the more that the Israelites were oppressed, the more they grew in number. And then this happened. <clears throat> Exodus 1, 15 through 17. My text today is from the Good News Bible. It says, Then the king of Egypt spoke to Shifra and Puah, the two midwives who helped the Hebrew women. When you help the Hebrew women give birth, he said to them, Kill the baby if it is a boy, but if it is a girl, let it live. But the midwives were Elohim fearing, and so did not obey the king. Instead, they let the boys live. Shifra and Puah. Write those names on a piece of paper and put them on your refrigerator for a little while because these are two women that we don't hear much about, but they need to become household names for a few reasons. They were the spearhead of the salvation of so many Hebrew baby boys. The king's command was to kill, to murder the little boys at birth. The midwives were placed in charge of this command seeing that they would be the first ones to see whether the baby was a boy or a girl. But the midwives feared, reverenced Almighty Yahweh over the king. The law of Yahweh said one thing, the king said another thing. The midwives went with what Yahweh said. They disobeyed the king in order to obey Yahweh. Anytime that a law of the land conflicts with a law that Yahweh gives, we should obey Yahweh rather than man. There are numerous examples of this in the Bible, but this in Exodus 1 is one of the first ones and the best ones. And we see that it is an example from righteous women. It wasn't like this was some little bitty feat. The king of Egypt had great power, the highest power in all the land. He gave the midwives a direct commandment and they disobeyed that commandment. They put their own lives on the line and they did it to save the most vulnerable of all lives, little babies. They did it because they feared Yahweh instead of the king of Egypt. And they were sneaky about it. Oftentimes we get all outspoken about our defiance against the unjust laws of men, and we want to shout it from the rooftops. That's not how Shifra and Pua did it. They were very intelligent, they were sneaky, and they were wise. It's okay to be sneaky for Yahweh. Let me say that again. It's okay to be sneaky for Yahweh. Yeshua even teaches us to be wise as serpents. Now serpents, let me tell you, they're sneaky. Trust me, I've been dealing with them all summer trying to get my chicken eggs all summer long. They are extremely smart animals. I knew that serpents were wise, but I really know that they're wise after this summer. Shifra and Pua were just as sneaky. Now I know this because of the next verses in Exodus 1. Look at Exodus 1, 18 through 19. It says, So the king sent for the midwives and he asked them, Why are you doing this? Why are you letting the boys live? They answered, The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They give birth easily, and their babies are born before either of us gets there. Well, when the king approached Shifra and Pua, I'm sure that it was not casual. It was probably in rage. He wanted the Hebrew boys dead. He'd already given the edict because he wanted the Egyptian kingdom to flourish and dominate over the Hebrews. The midwives gave their explanation. Now remember, verse 17 already told us that the Hebrew midwives feared the Almighty and did not do as the king had commanded. Verse 17 tells us they disobeyed the king, yet verse 19 has them telling the king that the Hebrew women are vigorous or lively. That's how it reads in the Hebrew text. Some commentators say here that the difference was that the Egyptian women were generally dainty and didn't do manual labor, 
In contrast, the Hebrew women were hard workers and out in the heat and the sun more, and they were used to having things difficult, so it made their labor easier. Not easy, but easier. That's what some commentators say. You know what I think? I think that the midwives lied to the king. That's what I think. I've read scholars who try to get around this because they think that it's always wrong to lie. But I believe what we learn here is that it is sometimes righteous to lie. Lying to cover up a sin is wrong. But when we lie in order to save someone's life or keep someone from wicked harm, it is righteous to lie in order to bring about healing, salvation, and safety. The reason I think this is because, once again, verse 17 already told us that the midwives disobeyed the king's orders. They let the baby boys live. Which means that they saw the Hebrew baby boys born and they did not kill them. Then verse 19 shows us they gave an excuse. However you cut it, however you see it, they were being crafty and they were being deceptive towards the king. Were they punished or rewarded by Yahweh for doing this? Look at the next verses, Exodus 1, 20 through 21. Because the midwives were Elohim fearing, Elohim was good to them and gave them families of their own. And the Israelites continued to increase and become strong. Yahweh blessed the midwives for disobeying an unrighteous law and then lying about it. Midwives back then were normally women who did not have children or could not have children themselves. Yet because of what these midwives did, Yahweh blessed them, it says, with families, with homes, homes of their own. And this was the beginning of how one Hebrew baby boy was saved from the claws of Egypt. Look at Exodus 2, 1 through 3. During this time, a man from the tribe of Levi married a woman of his own tribe, and she bore him a son. When she saw what a fine baby he was, she hid him for three moons. But when she could not hide him any longer, she took a basket made of reeds and covered it with tar to make it watertight. She put the baby in it and then placed it in the tall grass at the edge of the river. So now we come to the next righteous woman in the account, and this woman's name is Jochebed. Now we don't learn about her name here, but she's mentioned by name in Exodus 6 and in Numbers 26. And Jochebed was just as strong as the midwives. She had her baby boy during this time of enslavement to Egypt, and she hid her baby for three moons. Now I want you to think about this, mamas. Think of making sure that no government workers saw or heard this baby when they passed by your house or even when they came in your house to check for little baby boys. It wasn't like Moses was this abnormal baby who didn't cry or who didn't soil his diaper. He was a baby just like all babies. This mother had to be sneaky as well. We're learning today about the gift of sneaky. We've seen two sneaky midwives, and now we see a sneaky mama. And then I want you to look at how strong and full of faith Jochebed had to be to make the basket. She probably cried as she covered her basket with tar, and then later placed her little baby boy inside of it at the edge of the river. And I'm sure that she prayed many prayers up to that point. And while she stood there on the riverbank, she probably was praying as she watched the basket float away. She prayed for safety and protection of her child. I've heard a lot of testimonies over the years growing up in church about praying mamas. Mamas who prayed over and for their children when they were little, and then mamas who prayed for their son or daughter when they got older and went down the wrong path. I've also heard testimonies from people who said that they believed that they had a relationship with the Heavenly Father simply because they had a mama or a grandmama who prayed for them. I remember one time I found my mama praying for me. She was crying and I heard her say my name. 
She did that because she loved me. I didn't understand it at the time. I didn't understand it at all. But now as a grown man with children and grandchildren of my own, I can feel what my mama felt for me. She prayed for me because she cared about me. She cared about me more than her own self. She wanted what was best for me and she wanted me to have a strong bond with the Creator. And I'm thankful for my praying mama. There's one more strong woman I want to mention today, and that is Jacobed's daughter and Moses' older sister. Exodus chapter 2, verses 3 through 10. But when she could not hide him any longer, she took a basket made of reeds and covered it with tar to make it watertight. She put the baby in it and then placed it in the tall grass at the edge of the river. The baby's sister stood some distance away to see what would happen to him. The king's daughter came down to the river to bathe while her servants walked along the bank. Suddenly she noticed the basket in the tall grass and sent a servant woman to get it. The princess opened it and saw a baby boy. He was crying. She felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Well, then his sister the baby boy's sister, asked her, the princess, Shall I go and call a Hebrew woman to nurse the baby for you? Please do, she answered. So the girl went and brought the baby's own mother. The princess told the woman, Take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So she took the baby and nursed him. And later when the child was old enough, she took him to the king's daughter who adopted him as her own son. She said to herself, I pulled him out of the water, and so I named him Moses. The older sister of Moses is a woman named Miriam. Now we learn later in Exodus chapter 15 verse 20 that Miriam became a prophetess. Prophetess is simply the female form of the word prophet. Same thing, it's just a male form and a female form in Hebrew. And I'll talk about what it means to be a prophet or a prophetess in a later sermon. But here at a young age, maybe around 10 years old, Miriam was the one commissioned with the job of watching and following the basket that her mother had placed in the river. She followed it all the way to the place where the Egyptian king's daughter bathed. And the princess recognized this baby in the basket to be a Hebrew boy probably because the boy was circumcised. And notice that the text says that the princess felt sorry for the baby. Your Bible might say the princess had compassion on the baby. Now here is a fifth woman in our text today. We've talked about Shifra, Pua, Jacobed, Miriam. Here's a fifth woman, the princess, the Egyptian princess. She knew about her father's command to kill the Hebrew boys. Yet when she saw this Hebrew baby boy, she had compassion on him. She felt sorry for him. I'm sure that she figured that this child was in the basket on the river because a Hebrew mother was trying to protect the child from the king's commandment. So we see that even the Egyptian princess was used by Yahweh as a woman in his plan to bring about Moses, the Savior, the Deliverer of Israel. And look what happened. Young Miriam, who had been following the basket, was bold enough to walk up to the princess and speak to her about the baby. That took courage, and when she asked if the princess wanted, to, wanted her to find a Hebrew woman to take care of the baby, Yahweh moved the princess's heart. She said yes, and she even offered to pay the woman who would take care of this baby. It just so happened that the woman that was chosen to take care of the baby was Moses' actual biological mama. And she got paid by an Egyptian princess to do it. Jacobed ended up taking care of this baby boy probably for a couple of years or so. Hebrew women historically would usually wean their babies at the age of two to three years old. So Jacobed got to be with her son 
for a few years until he was adopted into the Egyptian family. So Jochebed's faith was rewarded here by Yahweh as well. We hear so much about Moses, but yet we hear so little about the women who made it possible for Moses to begin his life. Yahweh in Exodus 1 through 2 used five women to carry out his plans to deliver the Israelites from Egypt. Now I want to close today with a passage from the book of Micah. It's one of the minor prophets. That doesn't mean less important, but it's just a shorter book. Micah chapter 6, if you'd like to turn there. Micah 6, 1 through 4. I bring up this text because it's going to be the catapult for my next lesson and because it mentions Miriam. And this is a text that you don't hear much about, but it's in the Bible. There's a context to this. If you read the entire sixth chapter, Yahweh is actually getting on to the Israelites, but in the midst of this, he mentions Miriam. And in the book of Micah, chapter 6, beginning at verse 1, it says, Listen to Yahweh's case against Israel. Arise, O Yahweh, and present your case. Let the mountains and the hills hear what you say. You mountains, you everlasting foundations of the earth, listen to Yahweh's case. Yahweh has a case against His people. He is going to bring an accusation against Israel. Yahweh says, My people, what have I done to you? How have I been a burden to you? Answer me. I brought you out of Egypt. I rescued you from slavery. I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to lead you. Micah 6, 1-4. Miriam, the sister of Moses, was not just a behind-the-scenes woman in Israel. Yahweh mentions her here through the prophet Micah as one of the leaders who went before the people of Israel. Right along with Moses and Aaron. Who is the I in this text? In verse 4, I rescued you from slavery. The I there is Yahweh. Who is the you? Israel. I, Yahweh, rescued you, Israel, from slavery. So according to this verse, Yahweh sent not just Moses and Aaron before Israel, but He also sent Miriam before Israel, or as the Good News Bible says, to lead Israel. Now, if Miriam is mentioned here by Yahweh as being one of the leaders of Israel along with Moses and Aaron, why don't we mention her as a leader? Maybe she has gotten left out because she's female. In my next lesson, I'm going to talk more about Miriam as a prophetess from Exodus 15 and Psalm chapter 68. I'm also going, Yahweh's will, I'm also going to move into the book of Judges and we're going to talk about another prophetess and a judge over Israel named Deborah. And I'm also going to discuss what it means to be a prophet or a prophetess. Praise Yahweh for His women. Amen. Praise Yahweh for my wife. Father Yahweh, thank You for another time of teaching Your Word. Thank You for Your people. Let us hide your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Help us to believe all of it. Through your Son, I pray. Amen.